day His glory shone in the light of the world is Jesus. Hello. Welcome to Until Ministries. Thank you for joining us during this festive season when we are looking forward to the celebration of the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. When God became man, God became flesh, dwelt among us, uh, and eventually went to the cross, being our Savior, rising from the dead to give us eternal life. But we're trying to prepare our hearts for the real meaning of Christmas over the... <laughs> pardon me, over these weeks as we're coming up uh, to December 25th. Uh, it's a time when we need to focus on the real reason for the season, which is Jesus. And so we're trying to prepare uh, ourselves spiritually to celebrate this glorious time. And in order to do that, we're looking at several things. Um, and today we're going to be looking at the preparation. Last week, if you were here with us, we looked at the promises, some of the Old Testament prophecies and promises that God made uh, about the coming of Jesus and how they were fulfilled. Today, we're going to be talking about the preparation, which, of course, uh, deals with John the Baptist. So we're going to see how John the Baptist and especially his parents fit into this whole scenario. So let's look first of all today at the life of Zacharias and Elizabeth. The life of Zacharias and Elizabeth. And this is found in Luke chapter 1 verses 5 through 25. And I'm just going to read this in sections, but let's uh, read that first section here. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias of the division of Abaha, and he and his wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. So let's look first of all, as we uh, consider the life of Zacharias and Elizabeth, the servants, that is Zacharias, whose name means the Lord remembers, and Elizabeth, whose name means the oath or promise of God. So when you bring the names together of this beautiful couple, you find out that they're, together their names mean the Lord remembers his promise. The Lord remembers his promise. And remember, we looked at those promises last week, and we'll see again how God uh, uh, brings all these promises to reality. So they were both righteous, as we read. They were both walking blamelessly. They were devout. They were obedient. Um, and that's all important things in marriage. Now, when it says that they were both righteous and walking blamelessly and so on, uh, that doesn't mean they were sinless. All Every human being is, that has ever lived and every human being that is ever living now is is, is sinful. We all are sinners. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Um, the only perfect life that was ever lived in human form was the Lord Jesus himself, who never sinned in thought or word or deed. But this couple, um, compared to the times, was righteous. They, compared to the times, they were obedient. But the problem was they didn't have a child. And in those days, it was, kind of a, it was kind of a stigma. It was kind of a disgrace in that culture not to have a child. So Elizabeth being barren was a, a heavy burden for her to, to, to bear all those years. So what is the setting here that these servants were in? Well, it's dark, sinister, terrible conditions in Israel. In those days, it was just terrible for Israel. Um, and it was their own fault. The, it was dark and sinister times, terrible conditions. The king was degenerate. The temple was desecrated. The priesthood was degraded. And the people were debased. And what's more, there had been no prophetic utterance from, from the Lord in over 400 years. Because the people were so far away from the Lord, the Lord didn't speak to them for over 400 years. Yet he did not forget them. 
He never forgets us. He never leaves us or forsakes us. He didn't forget them. He didn't fail them. And we'll see. Now, we want to see the story behind what happened here. So I'm going to read again um, another section from Luke 1. We'll start at verse 8 this time. <coughs> Pardon me. Now, it happened that while Zacharias was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division, according to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering. And an angel of the Lord appeared to Zacharias right while he was in the holy place and fear gripped him. Fear gripped him. Zacharias was very fearful. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard. Your prayer has been answered, in other words. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son and you will give him the name John. And of course, this is John the Baptist. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. Isn't that something? And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. Remember I said how far they were away, degenerate and debased. It is he who will go as a forerunner. Here's the mission of John the Baptist. He would be the forerunner for Jesus. It is he who will go as a forerunner before Jesus in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of righteousness so as to make ready the people prepared for the Lord. And so that was what... Uh, this is an exciting situation. So Gabriel comes and speaks to Zacharias during this once-in-a-lifetime privilege of the priest being able to go into the holy place, holy of holies, and he tells him that he will have a son that will um, pave the way for that person who was going to turn Israel back to the Lord. And that would be Jesus, of course. But John the Baptist's mission was to prepare the way for Jesus and to turn the hearts of Israel in preparation for Jesus. And so the faithful prayers of this godly couple were answered even though they were delayed, very much delayed, because they were well on in years now, much past the years of normal um, parenting for the first time. And uh, but it's just a nice reminder to us today that God is faithful. He answers every single prayer. Sometimes he answers directly. That's the kind we all love. Sometimes he answers differently. He answers us, but it's a little different answer than we were looking for. Sometimes he delays. And that's what happened with Zacharias and Elizabeth. Uh, there was a huge delay, but it, God answered. And sometimes God says no. That's a denial. And so he always answers prayer, but not always the same way. So Zacharias, uh, obviously, we can't fault him here. He doubts and he seeks assurance. And he says, you know, wait a minute, angel. Uh, you know, are you sure about this? We're pretty old, you know, and this, this is something. And so what happened? He says, I am Gabriel. The angel said, I am Gabriel. And now, because you didn't believe, you are not going to be able to talk until this son, John, is born. And so Zacharias, because he doubted, he would not be able to talk until John was actually born. Wow. So... Um, Zacharias sought assurance like we do sometimes, but because the angel had been so direct and so clear, Zacharias was told, hey, you're not going to be able to talk now until John is actually born. Wow. So you can read about it in Luke chapter 1, 
uh, again, 5 to 25, read the whole passage when you can, and you'll see how he came out, and people wondered why he was delayed, and they worried about him, and then all of a sudden he couldn't talk, and he's writing, and and so on. So um, it's, a, it's a great, great story, but we must move on. So that's the life of Zacharias and Elizabeth and what they were going through and how they were told about their baby that was on the way. Now we want to look at the leap in the womb, the leap in the womb. And this we find in Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 45. And uh, what happens here is... Um, Let's just look at that. Um, the people were, uh, let me go back here and just um, let you know that the people were waiting for Zacharias and were wondering it as delay, as I said. Uh, but he remained mute. And when the day of his priestly service were ended, he went home. Um, and after these days, Elizabeth, his wife, became pregnant and she kept herself in seclusion for five months. Now, let's look at this, what happened when there was a leap in her womb. Now she's about six months pregnant at this point, And Mary, who would bear the Lord Jesus, Mary has now been told, we'll read this next week. We're going to get into this a little next week when we look at the announcements to both Joseph and Mary. But for right now, Mary's aware that she's going to have Jesus. She goes to visit her relative, Elizabeth, who is probably a cousin. And so when she enters and she hears Elizabeth's greeting, here's what happens. It says, now at this time, Mary arose and she went in a hurry to the hill country, to a city of Judah, and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in the womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby, that is John the Baptist, who remember was filled with the Holy Spirit while still in the womb, he leaped for joy right in the womb. And uh, I don't know what that does to people that don't understand that that life begins at conception. And in the womb, that is a real live human being. And John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit and he leaped for joy, and of course, Elizabeth felt that. Um, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. Now, what did Elizabeth mean by that? Well, Mary undoubtedly went to visit her relative because in that culture, it was a horrible disgrace to become pregnant outside of marriage. And everybody knew that she was engaged to Joseph, but they weren't married yet, and they weren't supposed to come together physically yet. And yet here's Mary pregnant. But of course, as we'll see next week, uh, of course that baby was not conceived by Joseph. That baby um, did not have a human father, Joseph. Joseph took care of him as a father would as he grew up. But that baby was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. That baby was born of a virgin. And here's Mary is a virgin, and yet she is coming, she's open to disgrace and ridicule and even stoning, you know. And the, the Old Testament law said if you commit adultery, which this was because it was, they say it was, then um, you should be stoned. And so Mary went to be with Elizabeth, and that's why she was there. So she was probably there to kind of ponder everything that had happened, you know, because um, this was a, an incredible situation because Mary was a, a righteous person and Joseph was a righteous person, and yet there's a baby there, and we'll see how they're reacted next week. But Mary, maybe Mary needed some time to ponder. Maybe Mary needed to escape the gossip and the ridicule and the possible stoning. When the Bible tells us that she stayed there for three months. Now remember, she got there at six 
months of Elizabeth's pregnancy and stayed for three months. So undoubtedly, the Bible doesn't tell this, this specifically, but undoubtedly Mary stayed there until John the Baptist was actually born. So when Mary uh, entered the house and gave Elizabeth a greeting, you heard what happened. The baby leaped in the womb and leaped for joy. So the Holy Spirit, um, in, working in the fact that the Bible tells us, as we just said, the Bible tells us that Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Bible tells us that John the Baptist, the baby, was filled with the Holy Spirit even while he was still in his mother's womb. And what was the result? The result was excitement when the Jesus, the idea of Jesus was going to be born, that excitement was shown in the leaping in the womb of the baby. Isn't that cool? And so the, the excitement shows that the Holy Spirit, listen to this, this is important, the Holy Spirit always points to Christ and not to himself. The Holy Spirit is pointing to Jesus, not to himself. And that's what's happening here as the Holy Spirit causes the baby to leap in the womb at the very idea that Jesus was going to be born when Mary was there. So the Lord was at the center of Elizabeth's life and she had excitement about the Lord and she had humility and she wasn't jealous. She didn't say, boy, how come you get to bear the Messiah and I just have this guy that's going to pave the way for him? There was no jealousy there. There was no uh, question about that. She had total humility. She was just so honored to be able to bear uh, the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ, who would be John the Baptist. And Elizabeth had an extraordinary grasp of, the, of this highly unusual situation. And you can see this in Luke 1, 39 through 45. Again, just read it when you can. But um, the, 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 the situation here is that uh, Mary is pregnant out of wedlock and yet she's a virgin and she's going to bear the son of God who is conceived by the Holy Spirit miraculously. And this is a highly unusual situation that some people today seem to have trouble grasping. We all have trouble grasping, but it's by faith. The Bible teaches that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. The Bible teaches that she, uh, that she gave birth to Jesus without ever having uh, human relations with Joseph until after the fact uh, of her first son, the Lord Jesus. As the Bible specifically says that J uh, Joseph kept her a virgin until after the birth of Jesus. And so we see here that Elizabeth had this extraordinary grasp of the things of the Lord and how this was going to happen in Old Testament prophecy and so on. Well, then we want to look at, so far, um, we've looked at the lives of Zacharias and Elizabeth, and we've looked at the leap in the womb. And now we want to look at the lyrics of Mary's expression of praise. And this is usually called the Magnificat. Um, and in Luke 1, 46 through 55, you will read uh, what's called the Magnificent uh, um, of, of Mary. And Magnificent is the first word in the Latin translation of what she said. And it means majesty of God. She says she's extolling God. And we need to remember that that's what she's doing. So when we look at the Magnificat, um, it said, and Mary said, I'm, I'm reading now from Luke chapter 1, 46 to 55. And Mary said, my soul exalts the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior, for he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave, his servant. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed or happy or joyful. For the mighty one has done great things for me. And, and she goes on to quote a lot of Old Testament scripture. And um, 
and talk about what Jesus would be doing and glorifying Jesus for what he would be doing after he was born. So as we look at the lyrics of Mary's expression of, of praise here, the Magnificat, its purpose is the praise and adoration and glorification of God. And its premise is the Old Testament scripture and prophecies. Were you to study the Magnificat, you'd see that it was loaded with Old Testament scripture from 1 Samuel, from the Pentateuch, from the law, from the Psalms, and from the prophets. Mary knew the word of God. She knew the Old Testament very, very well. And look at her perspective. We see the purpose is praise and adoration. The premise is the Old Testament scriptures, but her perspective is one of humility. Her perspective is one of a servant. Her, verse 38, her, her perspective is one of joy and one of gratitude and one of devoted service. This was an extraordinarily godly woman, and she um, expresses her glory and uh, the, her glorification and her praise of the Lord in this beautiful passage. And so that's the lyrics of Mary's expression of praise. And finally, we want to finish with the light in the darkness, the light in the darkness. And for this, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 1, 57 through 80, and we're going to look at John chapter 1 and verse 8. And of course, John was not written by John the Baptist. It was written by the Apostle John, but he tells us of John the Baptist, of course. So here's the light in the darkness. And if we look at verses, uh, we don't have time to read uh, 57 through 80, but uh, we'll just look at a couple key verses. Um, let's talk about... Um, the light being born, and that is uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, John, John chapter 1 and verse 8 tells us that Jesus is the light. John wasn't the light. He was just the forerunner of the light. And so uh, here's when the light in the darkness is <clears throat> the birth of John the Baptist. And here's what it is. It says, now the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth, and she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and her relatives heard that the Lord had displayed his great mercy towards her. She was barren, and now she's brought forth a son, and they were rejoicing with her. And it happened on the eighth day, in Jewish law, the eighth day they came to circumcise the child. And that's when they would name the child, circumcise and name the child, or the male child at the eighth day. And they were going to call him Zacharias after his father. But his mother answered and said, no, indeed, but he shall be called John. And they said, there's none of your relatives who's called by that name. And they said, this can't be. So they made signs to Zacharias, who can't talk. They make signs to him. And he asks for a tablet with signs. And he wrote as follows. His name is John. Zacharias obeyed. And, and notice Elizabeth obeyed too. She says, no, no, he's going to be called John. And they were all astonished. And after he said, his name is John, and at once his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed, and he began to speak in praise to God. And fear came on all those living around them and in all these matters being talked about all over Judea. And all who heard kept them in mind saying, what will this child turn out to be? Look at all the miracles that have happened. She who was barren has a child, uh, Zacharias is, is, is unable to speak for, for nine months. Um, then all of a sudden his mouth is loosed and he gives this beautiful praise, which is called the Benedictus, which uh, if we have time, we'll look at it a little bit. But the point here I want to make is 
this is talking about the light in the darkness. And John the Baptist was preaching about the light in this dark world I told you about, how terrible the world was at that time. Now, the servant, John means the grace of God. John means the grace of God. That's what the name means, or God is gracious. God is gracious, and he remembers his promise to Zacharias and Elizabeth, and John the Baptist is born. The grace of God, God is gracious, this, this male child was born. And so Israel, remember I told you, was in grave spiritual darkness, and John the Baptist is the forerunner. He's the prophet of the highest. He comes to prepare hearts um, for people to receive Jesus. And by the way, that's what you and I are supposed to do now. We don't have the power. We have the power of the Holy Spirit to share our faith and to help people prepare their hearts. And that's what we're doing as we go up to Christmas. Now, John 1.8 makes it clear that John was not the light, but he came to bear witness of the light. And so in the temple at the time of the circumcision, again, the eighth day, remember, everybody's expecting him to be named Zach Jr. They think, hey, this guy's got to be named Zach Jr. This miraculous birth, let's honor the father. And Elizabeth obeys, as I said, and she says, no way. His name is John. And the relatives don't let it drop. They, they, they pursue it and they say, hey, that doesn't make any sense. There's nobody in your family named John. And John, as I said, means grace of God or God is gracious. Jehovah has shown grace. And Zacharias is standing there and he can't talk. So he's consulted by signs and um, he writes, he asks for a tablet and he writes, John, his name is John. See the obedience there? He, despite peer pressure, despite tradition, both John and Elizabeth obeyed and they said his name is John. And his, Zachariah's speech was instantly restored and he praises God and he sings a song of praise, which we refer to as the Benedictus, because Benedictus is the Latin word that translates the first word of the song. And um, it means blessing. And, um, and it's a song of thanksgiving. It's a th song of deliverance. It's a song of mission. It's a song of salvation. Uh, and Christ is at the center Get this now. This is where I'm bringing it to you real and bringing it to myself. Christ is at the center of Zacharias song and his life. And that's what I'm challenging us with, myself included. Is Christ at the center of my life? Is Christ at the center of my song, my expression? Is Christ the center of all that I am? That's what we want to be like Zacharias and Elizabeth. So I ask you, do we have the life with Christ at the center? Do we have the leap? Are we excited about Christ? Do we have the lyrics of praise? And do we have the light bearing witness? Oh, may it be true in our lives during this Christmas season and always. God bless you. Thank you for watching. The Lamb is the light in the city of gold. The light of the world is Jesus. Oh yes, come to the light, tis shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see. Jesus, blind, but now I can see.